please, we're going to go to the book of James, chapter 4. James, chapter 4. I'm just going to read uh, verse 4. The Bible says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. I want to teach this morning on just that, that friendship with the world is enmity with God. So in the context of, of, of the verse, we're finding godly wisdom and worldly wisdom. We see that kind of spelled out. Obviously, one comes from God. The other comes from this present evil world. And uh, one edifies the church. One destroys the church. So it's, it, it's important that we get it right uh, on the wisdom that we gather. That's one of the reasons that we're told to not stand in the counsel of the ungodly because that kind of counsel is going to destroy the works of God and, and, and things of that nature that we have because it's not going to build you up spiritually. It's all sensual and devilish and carnal. All that kind of wisdom is. And so we see that one comes from seeking the wisdom of God. The other comes from walking contrary to God. So uh, spiritual wisdom and worldly wisdom are personal churches. Every day of our lives, we make choices. Some are good, some are bad. We, ever have, we have those choices, and we also have consequences to those choices. Uh, anything that we choose is going to bring something with it. It's never just a choice, unfortunately. Man, wouldn't it be great if you could just make a bad choice and then nothing happened, and then you could change it real quick before something, you know, uh, we didn't. We don't have that luxury. We make a bad choice, then those consequences pretty much rush in uh, to uh, to take us down. So, but James used some powerful words here to define the heart and the work of a carnal a carnal believer. He says, "Adulterers and adulteresses." Now, adultery defined, normally we are, we're defining adultery as a physical act outside of the bond of marriage. In our text, the principle is the same. And we'll look at both synonyms, which are the like words, and antonyms, which are opposites, that give clear picture of these words. Now, the Bible likens the saved individual's relationship to God as a marriage. Uh, and so in Ephesians chapter 5, uh, it also portrays it like that. The act of adultery is when a married man or woman commits the sin of stepping outside of the marriage for physical reasons. We who are saved also have the potential to do this in our, in our relationship with Christ. That you can either be faithful or you cannot be faithful, okay? And that's, that's what it is. Uh, and so... We who are saved have this potential, but he says, ye adulterers and adulteress, adulteresses. Now, the synonyms we find are, are cheating, infidelity, misconduct, two-timing, and unfaithful, uh, unfaithfulness. The antonyms are faithfulness and fidelity. So, adultery is one of the personal sins that's accompanied by a death sentence in the Bible. In Leviticus chapter 20, verse 10, the Bible says, And the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. So <clears throat> adultery is also uh, tied biblically to lust, because that's, uh, that's how it is. Then obviously lust is tied to sin. Sin is tied to death. And so on, and it goes. In uh, James uh, chapter 1, verse 14 through 16, the Bible says, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust. It's not somebody else's, it's your own. And enticed. Then, when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. And so... Uh, and then, of course, it goes on to say, do not err, my beloved brethren. 
So we don't want to, we don't, that's not something we want to mess with. All right, because lust is bringing forth when that's conceived. The, what it brings forth is sin. And sin, when it's done in its work, there's death involved. It's, it's just a whole process leading to our demise. So uh, he says friendship of the world is enmity with God. Friendship, according to the Bible, true friendship is characterized by love. The Proverbs, uh, the example of David and Jonathan, uh, and the instruction to the church, and ultimately uh, even Christ's sacrifice, uh, an, an example depict the true friendship uh, and true friend loves, gives wives counsel, remains loyal, uh, and, and forgives and promotes the other, another one's welfare. So, I mean, even though there's issues, there might be issues, they still get over it and it's still there because that friendship is more important than anything else surrounding it. So they clear the air there. And, and you keep that air clear because that's what we're supposed to do. As Christians, we don't need those things unresolved because unre uh, when, we don't, when we have things that are unresolved in our lives, it causes a complete breakdown of... It's like putting something in acid and watching it dissolve. It's like throwing your, throwing your good built up spiritual life and throwing it in a container of acid and all that bitterness and the anger and the frustration and all those things eat away at what all that work that you've done to apply things to your life and it ruins it all it corrupts it all and it just eats away at it and makes it just all go away and so that's the dangers of bitterness uh, and not clearing the air. That's a, a clear advantage that Satan will have over us if we, as God's people, do not clear the air. That's what true friendship is, and that's what true love is. Uh, we, we get rid of those things that are between us because we are more important than the issue. Your relationship, my relationship to you is more important than any issue that would come between us. So we have to work together to get that resolved because of the fact that our relationships are more important than whatever it might be that's trying to tear it apart. So uh, enmity, Genesis 3.15, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. So you could talk about hatred and variance there. Uh, the friend of the world is flat out called the enemy of God. Enemy of God. Friend, you know, the ideas of friend and friendship involve three basic components. There's association, there's loyalty, and then there's affection. Now, an enemy is an opponent or stands against or one who hates. So think about that for a minute. If we're friends with the world, then that means there's enmity with God. It's almost like you're hating God because you're friends with the world. That's a scary thing for anybody. I don't think that's ground anybody wants to be standing on, that me being friends with the world would be as me hating God, according to the Bible. Because Matthew 6, 24 says that no, one, no man can serve two masters for who either hate the one and love the other or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon, right? So we have the war of the flesh, uh, and we're going to talk about a few things this morning uh, dealing with this. There's the spirit that dwelleth in us. The spirit was placed within man before he ever came to know Christ as Savior. Uh, as man was made in the image of God, a trichotomy or, uh, or three that makes one. He made us a trinity. There's mind, there's body, and there's spirit. That's a work of God. That's a creation of God. It takes a trinity to make a trinity. Amen? So we, we see that, that he put within us these three things. 
uh, that, that make us what we are. And so he made to be man God conscious, body and world conscious, and then soul, which is self conscious. We have the spirit of God consciousness, right? So John chapter 1, verse 6 through 9, the Bible says there was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear light, up, witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. So from birth and innocence, the light of God dwells within people and all people. Now to become atheistic, one must quench that light. You got to kill that. And of course, there's all kinds of ways that the school system, it starts right in the school system and works its way through. The whole world is corrupt. Remember that? Uh, you know, and I know we've got to learn. I know we've got to this, and I'm not knocking teachers. I'm not knocking any of that. But don't be surprised when you put people through the world system that they come out worldly. Don't be surprised. You're putting them into a place that is designed to quench the light of God in them. Everything that it's built around, all the precepts, all the teachings, all of those things are designed to squash out the light of God and bring about an atheistic type of mindset. And then that will make them more conformable to world systems as they come out of the school system because the school system is teaching the world system. So don't be surprised when that happened. What happened? I tried to write, you know, sorry that hour or two hours maybe that, that they had in church didn't overcome, you know, all the hours that they spent in the world system learning contrary to what you're trying to teach them. That's why you need to pray for your Sunday school teachers. That's why you need to pray for these people that are trying in this small half hour, 45 minutes, to get through somebody's head, you know, all these hours that have been spent not hearing God's word, all of these hours that have not been spent hearing the works of God and that God made them and that God loves them, they, they drain the light and take, take away the purpose of that individual. If you want to know why people, more of these young people are taking their own lives, it's because they feel that they're not here for anything. They've extinguished the light that God puts in them, telling them that he has a purpose for them, which would then, oh, well, that makes sense. Okay, now I have a purpose. I have a reason to be here. Not, oh, well, you know, my boyfriend broke up with me, and now I'm, I just don't have any purpose in life, or my girlfriend broke up with me, and now I have no purpose to be here. And, you know, they're already, they're, it's hard enough. It's hard enough being a teenager with all the different things that are going on inside the teenager. I remember what it's like. It's not been horribly long ago that since I was one. I'm still one up here, but that don't help me anywhere else. That usually ends up backfiring on me. <laughs> but see, it's hard enough just coping with the changes of trying to get into adulthood and overcoming all these other obstacles that we find all this, and it's very stressful. So then you have, if you have a high-stress situation and you have no hope and no purpose, that's, that's what breeds all those things. There are staggering statistics that people even as young as five years old have tried to take their life staggering statistics. That's why young people need more help. That's why we need to be pushing to get more young people because these are people that need to understand that God loves them, that there is a God. He loves them. He has a purpose for them. They have a specific thing that, they, that God wants them to do. 
and we need to teach them and love them. Okay, so we see that 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 that's what's that's what's happening. Uh, from innocence to guilt or knowledge of sinfulness, that light remains in an unregenerated man. After salvation, man spiritually becomes a dichotomy, the old nature and the new nature. Uh, though saved, the old nature still uh, continues to desire the things of the flesh, despite the new nature that desires the things of God. That's why we nurture one and not the other. We're trying, the Bible teaches us, to not get in to feeding the flesh, but rather to, to feed the spirit. Because whatever you feed is going to be stronger when temptation comes. So we see that. So it's here that the spiritual battle rages. So, and then uh, it was mentioned that it lusteth to envy. Now there's potential here for the saved man to become a carnal man. There's no eradication of the old man once you get saved. But wouldn't that be great if you come and you get saved and then you just were the spiritual light that you ought to be and you didn't even have to fight that old man no more because he's gone. That, to me, would be awesome. That's going to be one of the biggest blessings about heaven is what's not there. I don't have the old man there no more. I don't have temptation there no more. I don't have aches. I don't have pains. I don't have sneezes. I don't have colds. I don't have anything else going on. There's no sin. There's no remembrance of it. I, I've got all the things that are not there that make heaven heaven. And I love that fact. I love that fact. And it would be wonderful if we could just get saved and go through the waters of baptism and not have to ever worry about fighting that old flesh and just be the light that you should be. I mean, wouldn't that be great? I think that would be awesome. I would sign up for that. I totally would sign up for that. But you know what? We're, we have to, until God gives us that body, we have to wait for it. We desire a tabernacle not made with hands, right? We want that heavenly one. I want to get rid of this one because I, I don't, I'm not really a fan. I'm not really a fan of this shell. I want to get rid of this one and put one on that won't hurt. I want to put one on that, that won't ever have to worry about stumbling and fa failing the Lord. I want one that will, have, uh, that will be perfect in every way. And that's what God has for all of us. But in the meantime, we've got to sit here and fight the, that old man and contend with him. And, and it causes us a bunch of issues and problems. As long as, I, as long as you and I live, we're going to be battling the flesh as we, will try to, as we try to live a consistent life in the Spirit for God. We have to fight those things, and, and you know, one day that fight will be done. <clears throat> Romans chapter 7, verse 14 through 25, the Bible says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, uh, I, do I allow not. For what I would, that I do not, but what I hate, that do I. I uh, if then I do that which I would not, I consent under the law that it is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but the sin that dwelleth in me. For that I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would, for I uh, for the good that I, I I would I do not, but the evil which I would not that I do. Now if I do that which I would not, it is no more I that doeth the sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind. And bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. So even Paul 
and saying, listen, those things that I, that I do, I don't, you know, I, 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 the things that I want to do, I don't do. And the things that I hate, the things I shouldn't do, that's what I'm doing. Because that's, that's what my flesh wants to do. And that's why you're going to hear a lot of different things. You'll hear, follow your heart. No, don't ever do that. It's desperately wicked. And it's always going to take you the route of what your flesh wants to do. Everything. It, it, I like to do it this way. If it's comfortable for me, then I don't want to do it. In God's world, okay? If it's comfortable in my flesh to do it, that means I shouldn't do it. If it's something I don't want to do, then that's probably what I need to be doing. If it's out of the comfort zone, then that's something that God wants me to do. Not something that, not something, if everything, it's, you know, it's like the opposite. <clears throat> it's like you want to, you, the things you want, you want all this good stuff here, but that's just leading you to the flesh and feeding the flesh. I need to be over here on the Brussels sprout side of things that I don't want that are better for me, <laughs> right? That's, that's what I want. And, and so, you know, I got to, I gotta, if, you know, my, 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 if I follow my heart, man, I'm not going toward the Brussels sprouts. I'm not. I'm headed for something much better for me. <laughs> That's what I think. But my flesh wants the banana pudding, but my flesh needs the Brussels sprouts. My spirit needs the Brussels sprouts. Okay, so it's not something that I want to do soul winning. That's definitely Brussels sprouts to people. They don't want no part of that. Right? Oh, the fellowships? Oh, we're all on board, man. We're building churches with nothing but fellowship. So we see that, you know, that's the mentality. These people are trying to use the flesh to draw people in. You can always get a good crowd when you've got food involved, even in an independent fundamental Baptist church. You can get people with food. As a matter of fact, I knew uh, Rachel and I, uh, when we were first married, flew to Florida didn't seem like, it was like right on the cusp of Georgia. It didn't even look like Florida. I don't even think there's a palm tree. So I'm like, how, how is this Florida? You guys don't even have a palm tree. But this church, they had their morning service, and then they had like this potluck after, after church, and then they did like a little afternoon thing, a uh, little afternoon service right after it, and that was it for the rest of the day. They were doing that because it was working better for them than what they had tried to do before. But every Sunday it was that. Every Sunday, people bring their potluck, they have their morning service, they dismiss, they go over to the fellowship hall, they eat, they fellowship, they come back over uh, for a shorter, uh, a shorter, I think the afternoon service was only even for like 45 minutes. They might have had a congregational one special and then he preached and then it was done for the day. And I thought, man, this is weird. Because I, I wasn't accustomed to that. You know, I, I wasn't accustomed to that at all. But that's what they were doing to try to get people in. You can always seem to get people in with food. Uh, when the food stops and they stop. I mean, there's all kinds of, all kinds of evidence of that everywhere. But see, we don't want to do that. We want, we, want to, uh, we want to not focus on those things. We want to have uh, a spiritual mindset. We want to be able to feed the, the Spirit of God and do the things that God wants us to do. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't have food and fellowship. Don't take me wrong. I'm just saying that those things are good. They've got their place. Uh, all of that, but what I'm saying is that, that a lot of people nowadays, you'll find that they're just there for the fellowship and to be told that they're okay the way they are and walk out the way they came in. That's what people want. They don't want to be told that their body is not their own, that it was bought with a price. They don't want to know that you're not supposed to do this and you're not supposed to do this. You're supposed to do this, this, and this instead. They don't want those things. You know, we live in 
that day and that age where they're not enduring sound doctrine because they don't have to. There's a church on every corner. There's some place on the internet that they can go and sit in their jammies and have coffee and just watch somebody say something inspirational about how good they are. I, I believe in balance. I believe in letting you know that there's good. I, I don't sit there and just all the time just say the, the, the bad things. And even if I do, you'll see that, that I'll give you the good things with it. I don't ever just preach a, this is, you're all bad and have a good night. <laughs> I don't do that. I'm not going to leave. Well, how do, you got Monday to deal with, brother. I'm not going to do that to you on a Sunday. You know, I mean, it's terrible. You know, that's just how it is. You don't just beat people up when you come here. But you know what? Don't expect, if you really want to get with God... He's going to light you up through the Holy Spirit of God. But you know what I love about God? It's when he's beat me to a pulp over stuff that he just loves on me. And I heal up really quick. I heal up a lot faster than when I beat myself up. That takes a while. But when God takes the Bible and he, and he, through the Holy Spirit of God, and he says, you need this. You need this. You're not doing that. Hey, did you hear that? You're not doing that. That's what God does. You ought to be doing this. When's the last time you did that? Then everybody gets mad at the preacher. How does he know what I'm, no, I don't know nothing. I don't know a thing about it. I don't even know what you're talking about. The Holy Spirit's inside you to deal with you. It's not my job to deal with you. It's the Holy Spirit's job to deal with you. All I'm here for is to give you what God gives me. And it's for me too. It's, you know, I need this stuff more than you guys do. I'm the preacher. You're the preacher. What are you talking about? Because I'm robed in the same corruption you are. I have to fight this stinking thing all the time. I don't like it. I'll be happy to lay that thing down. That's going to be a great day. But we all need to just understand that we're not here to make God and to make the Bible be all we want it to be. It's here to make us what God wants us to be. That's the Bible's job. And you're not going to get, last time I checked, when you're trying to conform something to something else and mold it, that's a hard process. It requires some smashing sometimes. Anybody had too much to load in your car and you're going on a trip? You ought, Man, I, I smash everything in the back of mine. You ought to have seen some of the work that I can do. Oh, it's a beautiful thing. I don't need, see, I've, I dro I drove, I've driven some of the bigger trucks and learned how to use my mirrors. I don't need the rear window. I'll smash that thing up here. I'll shut the door, and then I'll get in there, and I'll smash it from that side. <laughs> and I already know, I don't, I already know an avalanche is waiting at the end of the trip, and that's fine, because... Unless, unless there's an emergency, I've got everything I need where I need it, and I don't have to touch anything back there. We went to Tennessee several years ago with our family back when uh, we had our van. I had that thing packed to the hilt, man, packed. I took pictures of it. It was so good. <laughs> it was so good. I'm like, can you believe Look, this is like a masterpiece. Look at this car. It is packed, and we still have a path to walk in. Ain't it cool? I love it. Good stuff. So in our text, we find that the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy and envy is sin. The question is asked, do you think that the scripture saith in vain? Vain is to no avail. God's saying pay attention to the text or you'll be next. 
I'm a poet and don't know it. <laughs> Pay attention to the text or you'll be next. That's what he's saying. So we all have potential to become uh, detrimental to the unity and the fellowship of the local church if we don't watch, watch ourselves. And I, I, I want to end uh, with some uh, well-known to, uh, to the most here. 1 John 2, 15 through 17 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away in the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Closing scripture is Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 through 25. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. That's capital S, that's referring to the Holy Spirit. These are contrary one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance against such there is no law, and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. See, it's up to us to crucify the flesh and the affections and lusts. Those bad things that are in our flesh, that's what we have to kill every day. That's what we have to lay in a grave every day because it's like a zombie. It just keeps coming back. Eventually, we'll get rid of it when Jesus comes back and eliminates all of that, but it's just going to keep popping up, and you got to kill it every day. The days we don't do it are the days that we're going to find real struggle and real problems because they war against our spirit. They war against the Holy Spirit in us. And they, they, they are working bad things within our members and within ourselves. And that's just adding more fuel to the fight. It's just, it's like if you could shut down the fight, that's what you want to do. You don't want it to continue to play out. You don't want it to continue to go on till some till something's dead or permanently injured or totally wrecked. You got to shut it down. So that's what we have to do. We have to shut down that flesh part of our thinking. Shut down those affections and those lusts that we find ourselves uh, having in the world because we realize that friendship with the world is enmity with God. That's hate mingled with disgust. That's, that's a bad thing. And we don't want that. We don't want it to appear as though we hate God because we're not willing to deal with it. Because we just like the world just a little bit too much. You know, there's some good things that are that we like to enjoy in the world. There's nothing wrong with them. But... You know what, when we, when we have those close connections too much, it starts affecting our relationship with God. Anytime, and you can think back over your lives, that any time that you've really valued something inside the world for too long, 
it always affects your spiritual life to the point you're ready to reject some things from your spiritual walk, from your spiritual life, so that you can continue to enjoy those things that you want in the world. That's not where we want to be. That's not the land. You might as well view that as camping in the land of oh no, because that's going to be a bad thing. Let me tell you, you do not want to dwell in the land of oh no. And that's where we end up a lot of times. And being friends with the world is definitely putting you on a one-way trip to oh no. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time. Pray, Father, that it's been a help and a blessing to your people. I pray, Father, that you would help us to use it, Lord. Help us to uh, look inside ourselves and uh, get rid of those things that uh, that we're attached to, Lord. If, if we're attached to the wrong things, Lord, help us to cut away from them today. Help us, lead us, guide us, direct us, Lord. Bless us and use us, Lord. I pray if you'd bless the uh, service to come and those that are on their way uh, to the church now. And I uh, pray for those that can't be here due to traveling. Pray that you'd help them, Lord. Give them a good time where they're at, Lord. Bring them back safely pray, Father, for those that are not here due to illness and sickness, that you would help put a healing hand on them, that they would be able to return, and we would be able to see their sweet smile again soon. Bless us now in Jesus' name. Amen.